Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode here on Tales from the Wandering Scribe and the Wandering Quill. I am your host, Gabriel Garcia, otherwise known as the Wandering Scribe and the Wandering Quill. Join me today as we have another author here on the channel. Our guest today <clears throat> is a former submariner turned student of history. He is a PhD candidate researcher at the University of Portsmouth, MA in Naval History from the University of Portsmouth, and a BA in History from Southern New Hampshire University. He has written many articles and edited many chapters on maritime naval history. And currently, he is the author of the book, The Silent Service's First Hero. Joining us today for the first time on the show, author and naval historian, Ryan Walker. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have me. Thank you. You're Please welcome. You're welcome. Oh, crap. <laughs> uh, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> so before we dive into <laughs> no problem before we dive into the uh book tell us a bit more about yourself mm -hmm. currently i'm a historian i'm also a test engineer i do quite a few things uh history is my passion though and i'm glad to announce that i've actually made a historical work using a lot of my my basis in as the submarine force as a former submariner and a medal of honor recipient named henry bro and I've been always I've always been interested in history and I've always really appreciated the time to put together a good historical analytical piece. And I'm happy to say that I get to do that. And in addition to my normal duties as as a test engineer. So that's where I'm at right now. And I look forward to doing more historical works and look forward to answering some questions on. Awesome. Awesome. And speaking of historical works, what can you tell us about your current work that you're working on and what is the history behind this story of yours? So I have three general specialties, and I'll start with the I did my actual MA work on privateers, so I call them private men of war. I'm trying to rebrand them. I've done a few pieces on that. Uh, naval capital towns, so specifically reframing the military industrial complex in terms of the places where actual production and actual service work does. Mm -hmm. And this one falls under submarine history. Submarine history is very important to me. And uh, understanding where subculture, as I call it, SUB, uh, capital C, subculture, play on the word, of course, actually originated from. And to me, that era is 1915 to 1940, which is where I'm doing my PhD research on. The Silent Service's first hero specifically falls in that time frame as well. That's about a submariner named Henry Bro. Bro was a torpedo man's first class. That's how he actually ended up passing away at the rank. Uh, but he did his action as a second class petty officer. I took sources and I, I'm doing research while actually doing my MA work. And I realized, wow, there's really not a lot on him. I happened to find that the National Archives digitized his official military personnel file, which is a large document that's associated with all naval personnel sellers. As a matter of fact, if anyone listening is looking to do work on an ancestor that was in the military, you can request their files and actually use those to reconstruct their career. I also use census records, some newspapers. Digitization of newspapers has been great, but you always get to be a little bit careful with newspapers, of course. Museum archives, memoirs, contemporary films, and other forms, uh, other mediums that cultural representations would come. So I took that, all the sources, and I reconstructed his life and career as a micro historical subject. And I, I'd like to explain. To me, the first part is how we got there, which was he was kind of forgotten until about 1990. And really? slowly over. Yeah, there was a huge gap uh, about and there actually is an article out right now. Uh, construction of a naval hero in the International Journal of Maritime History that talks about this. Basically, he 1924, he gets his award. About 1924 to 40, people kind of knew about him. There, there was, It was a niche subject, but people generally knew about him. And about 1940 to about 1984, there was almost nothing on him. Like, no one really referenced him in submarine history. People love talking about the Medal of Honor recipients from World War II, all captains, all very deserving of their Medal of Honor. But the, the eighth Medal of Honor recipient was forgotten. There mm. was a very, very deliberate restructuring. Uh, restructuring research into this, and they realized, well, we have an eighth. His name is Henry Bro. 
And one person mentioned to me actually very well, uh, Ted Dubay, who was a submariner in that period. He was like, yeah, I don't remember hearing about him. Uh, and we were we weren't too worried about him at the time. And it was a really interesting perspective to think because they they had other things to worry about. They had the World War Two heritage. A lot of people served in World War Two from that era and actually understand that that period much better from that connection. So this was revived in about 1990 to for people like me who post Cold War, they didn't really have a they didn't really have a crisis to define themselves against. Right. So they were saying, all right, they're. There are things that are important. There are things that can happen on the submarine that are that in a, a moment's notice, like what happened with Bro. So I'm standing in front of this exhibit in 2015, in February of 2015, actually. Uh, and I I just saw this exhibit as a young aspiring submariner in basic enlisted submarine school. And I said, wow, that, that, that to me is what a submariner is. It's a person who's willing to risk his life. Now, Bro, when he was... When he was on the USS 05, they were transiting the Panama Canal. Mm. Now, the the 05, going through the Panama Canal, they see a steamship, the Abangadas. Now, the Abangadas is part of the United Fruit Company. Uh, we're not exactly sure what happened. But we do know that they hit. They had a collision. And the collision caused a massive gash in the 05. Most of the crew was able to get off. They, they abandoned ship. Bro was in the watch on the torpedo room. Now, torpedo rooms all the way forward, there's a hatch right there. He looks up, and he sees the ship sinking. He sees most of the crew, and he he says, I'm pretty sure there's someone down there. I want to... So he shuts the hatch on himself, goes and finds his chief... Well, not his chief, but electrician's mate chief, petty officer, Lawrence Brown. And they like, we got to get out of here. Brown was asleep. He didn't realize... Like, I'm sure he felt the... It was such a collision. Right, I'm sure he right. felt it. He's like, ah... Something's happening. We'll figure it out. I mean, it's a small ship. Rocking waves aren't unusual. Even in even in areas passed through a wake, anyone who's ever been on a small boat in a wake can understand that. But by the time that they Brown was ready to go, they were already under the water. So they go to the torpedo room and shut the watertight tor- door there. So they hung out there for 32 hours, 31 to 39 hours. I think 32 is probably the reasonable one based off the deck log. So they were they waited three times. Panama Canal community, who also deserves a lot of credit in the story, moved water and earth to get them there. Wow. To get them up. And there's a picture actually of the, the bow of the submarine pointed up and they're leaving the hatch from that. Um it really is an impressive story all around. And it was it came at a point where they'd had a couple submarine tragedies. There was a lot of submarine tragedies in the interwar period. Uh, the F-4 and the F-1 happened. They they were lost with all hands. So the United States Navy was very excited. Like, look, we finally, we did it right this time. And actually, there there was some major changes that were done after the S-51 and S-4. But I think the O-5 was the real, like, huh, if people are trapped under there, we don't know what to do. If Lawrence Brown and, and Henry Bro are down there, how do we get them? It was a real question in their mind, mm. and they were trying to figure it out. So to, that's the history behind Bro, and that that's probably reasonably what you could expect from anyone who'd ever read something prior to this book, their knowledge on that. Fascinating, fascinating. And when you were creating uh, this book, uh, what was the initial feedback like? Did you share it with um, other uh, uh, maritime uh, historians, other maritime enthusiasts? And if so what was their initial feedback like so i had dr i was working under matthew heaslip and Catherine pierce over at portsmouth and i was also working with mike asbester now all three of them had played they were they were like, oh that's an interesting story but what what's more so what why should we care and that's an excellent way they always right. push that every time even with my phd research why should you care so what because that's an important part of the historical research is connecting it to the audience it's like mm-hmm. it's important to me clearly how why would it be important to someone else so in this case it was very much uh oh that's interesting oh that's interesting mike uh, particularly was like uh, my actual uh article that was put out in the international journal of maritime history was actually really focused on the portions that he was like that's fascinating this is the portion that because that there was more focused on the analytical portion of how the story was revived and why um as I said, I was like, I'm going to write a book on this because I realized I'm looking at the dates on the 2021. 
This happened in 1923. He received his award in 1924. We're coming up on a pretty important anniversary here. And we yeah. really don't know much about him. I probably know the most about him. So that's, what, that's when the book really started coming about. And I mentioned this idea. And they're like, yeah, anytime you have a a centennial, especially, because 100 years, that's an important milestone. That's the point at which it's it's old history, almost to say. Ancient history, <laughs> in, <laughs> especially in this day and age. So the early feedback was very positive. And I mentioned it to submariners. And the, <laughs> I actually worked with a bunch of former submariners at the time when we I'd share stories because bro lived a very interesting life and a very fun life. Uh, and that's part of the, the joy of being an enlisted sailor in general is we, we get to have fun and bro, bro had so many episodes in it where they're so relatable, even to a sailor today. Um, he fell behind on car payments on his very expensive car he bought. Yeah. Um, he used, he used to, which was a standard procedure at the time. He used his captain, who was in charge of him, Captain Nimitz. In 1933, that was Chester W. Nimitz. So he met a lot of these important people that we recognize, and he intersected their past through naval chain of command. Probably didn't have a huge amount of huge amount of time with him, but it, it's a fun thing to see these these connections out of right. in the interwar period. And I, I really truly believe that this is the portion that. The submarine force began to get its identity. Like I'm now a submarine, not just a sailor who happens to be on the ships. They started defining themselves in the relationship to this technology. So we have a mature enough technology. We have personnel like Bro to man them and stay on them for long periods of time. It really is a fascinating history period, and people have really appreciated that. Have gotten the initial reviews and have really appreciated the insight that it could give. Awesome! Awesome. Now, what would you say is only like your promise you're making to someone who has never researched or picked up a book about submarine uh, history and they're completely green? What is your promise you're making to them if this is their first book? My promise to them, uh, it, it'll depend on the audience member. For submariners who read it, you'll be amazed. that the, They will be absolutely amazed at what the pig boat sailors had to go through. Uh, they were actually referred submarines referred to as pig boats. And really? that's because yeah, that's because of how rough the conditions were, especially anyone who's ever read uh Bobette Gugliata's Pig Boat 39. That's the reference. It was tough living and Bro spent a lot of his time in tropical areas like Panama or the Philippines. They didn't have AC on these submarines. There was no air conditioning yet. Yeah sweltering temperatures it doesn't take much to realize just how uncomfortable this living is and it'll give a greater appreciation for where that came from and how how much information that comes from sorry playing defense against my cat here <laughs> <laughs> the the submariner should be able to take a lot of this and maybe it'll it help me make peace with the parts of my career and i hope it'll help others make peace with their parts of their career for for people who have never heard about submarines, who really didn't understand what submarines were and what what they could do, I think this could offer some perspectives on 1920s and 1930s life. What's cool about a sailor is they were both part of American culture, but they also were spent a long period of time away from it. I think of the movie from the period, Born to Dance, 1936. They they're singing "Rolling Home" and they're coming back. And there's a portion with the the chief Ted Barker, who's actually uh, Jimmy Stewart from A Wonderful Life. Right. He's he's he sees the uh, female lead and says, "Hey, if a guy needs to go see go to, need, wants to meet a woman, how does he do it?" Like that's actually probably an authentic encounter. Like, what are the rules of dating? It's been four years; they don't know anymore. So I really think if you look at Bro's life and Bro's interaction with the outside world, it'll give a fresh perspective on 1920s and 1930s America. Awesome. That's actually really cool because it does put it in perspective because you're right. These men are put on a ship for a long period of time, separate from their families or if they had families of their own. And when they come back, it's like that old, um, that the age old phrase where you can't really be the same person anymore because the world around you is completely evolved. It's grown. It's grown up without you. And you're kind of locked in this period of time so that is really fascinating because you do get a chance to see uh what their life is like and what american life is like through their eyes and i would imagine would it would be safe to say that they would they would feel kind of like a stranger in their own home because 
it, it's not the same home that they remember when they first enlisted. Yeah, I think I think The Stranger is a great move, a uh, great way to. You're a stranger in your own house, almost. Um, mm -hmm. And what one of the cool things, anyone who's ever watched the '70s movies, Cinderella, Liberty, The Last Detail. That that author, he was a sailor. Uh, Daniel Poinsett, I want to say, I can't remember exact. I can't remember his last name exactly, but uh, his book, The Last Detail, he actually has the main character Badusky taking a nap, but he had been reading The Stranger by Albert Camus. And I actually tell people Camus actually captures what it's really like to be out to sea better than most, because Camus' main character Merceau in that in that book he actually is in jail, and he said the first thing I realized is I couldn't just get up and do something that I wanted to do, and I would argue that that that's exactly how I felt underway, is you have these moments of introspection where it's like I wanted to do that, but where we can't. Your freedom's right. kind of taken away in some respects, and that world becomes very different. He started. That's when Marceau starts really looking at at his interactions very differently, and that's how I felt as a sailor, and that's how I feel like a lot of sailors feel. So, I hope I hope it grants some perspective in that case from that that lens and that understanding. Interesting, interesting. So, it's safe to say that this story is not solely just about the history of submariners of the 1920s, 1930s, but it's also a very human story to look at the human experience as a military man especially a sailor in the 20s and 30s yeah i i one thing that frustrates me personally and and something i think that has been rectified in british naval history very well is kind of a lack of focus on the enlisted person there, there's always going to be people who are interested in reading about officers for leadership there's always going to be people who are interested in the technology well, what about the people who are on these? Like, think about the people who are on these ships without AC in Panama, right. <laughs> like Caribbean and 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 the Pacific. They they went through a lot. They endured a lot, so that way they they can get to the technology point that we are today. And that's that human element is a very, I hope, will continue to be a very important part of my research. Fascinating, fascinating. So, when constructing this book, I would imagine it's taken a lot of time and research to really fine tune it. And I'm sure, as you know, like as historians, it's a very, very lonely feeling trying to put all your work into your project, or as my friends say, your baby, that it's something that you're really, really passionate about. So my question to you is, in those moments where it's like you get stressed with like everything, either it's like other uh, obligations, other projects, what still motivates you to write about history and continue learning about history? The biggest thing for me is I, I feel like we I like to to use hyperrealism from Jean Beauriard. Hyperrealism is an idea that we live in a world of simulacra and simulation. Simulacra is the something that has no origin. Think of meme. A meme is kind of that way. It, it permeates our existence and we understand our world. We access our world through our culture. Now, hyperrealism to me is a very big danger to our modern understanding. And as a child of hyperrealism, I've never really been satisfied with that. So to me, microhistory and a lot of the other historical methods that focus on people, that's a way to actually look past those veneers and try to understand why people find these things cool. And it, it, you could say that, oh, that's phenomenology. I I think phenomenology has been undermined by hyperrealism. So mm. when I when I write these works, my own historicity is very important in this. So I, I try to understand my own path and why I understand what I understand and how I understand what I understand. Bro is a major figure in my past. I mean, yeah, I didn't know him, but I do know him in a way. I know that cultural icon that he is to the submarine force. He's a bit of a folk hero for us. He's the only enlisted submariner that got the Medal of Honor. That's going to be a big deal. Why he did that and how he did that is important. And we right. didn't really know that. So in this case, I feel like I'm poking at hyperrealism and trying to find <laughs> around those corners and try to find what's actually sort of hidden by that. Fascinating. That's actually really, really cool. And it really does really make you think. And speaking of that, using it as a, um, not tangent, but as a um, motion to the next question, who would you say has been like your biggest role models in terms of like studying history and presenting history? Because I've met a lot of historians and authors who have usually two different uh, people that usually help. Either it's like a professor they had in grade school or a person they've met 
um, in their own life. So what about you, Ryan? Who has really helped you navigate the world as an historian and present history to the general audience? Our first person to introduce me to history and how I started loving it is my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother would tell me stories. We'd watch the History Channel together. She kind of realized that she nurtured that. <laughs> my parents also realized that very early on, so I'm very appreciative to them. Uh, I did have a lot of history teachers who always accepted that uh, I liked history and I, I really read the material very well. We'd have passing debates and things like that. Um, as far as professional, I will, I've will. i mentioned John Beauregard, his, the idea of an Umberto Echo. So semioticians like that are very important to me. Carlo Ginsberg is probably the first one to introduce me to microhistory in particular. Uh, Cheese and the Worms. He has a really he has several really good articles on describing the process of what sources he chose and what sources he intended to use. And I very much enjoyed that. Um, there, there's of course my supervisory team now: Matthew Heaslip, Catherine Pierce, Robert James. Robert James being the primary, Matthew the secondary, and Catherine being the third. And then Mike Espester, I mentioned too. He's also been an important part of this shaping my as a as a historian recently. So I really cannot say enough good things about the University of Portsmouth. They, I mean, they had a naval history program. I I walked into and I loved it. Awesome, awesome. So it seems like you've had like a really great collection of people that have really um, nurtured your growth in historian, which I think is really cool because as historians, especially as I'm learning in my own field. It is kind of a feel that you do have to network. You do have to make connections with a lot of people and they really give you a new sense of skills. And speaking of skills, I don't think I, I asked you this earlier, but uh, and maybe you've already answered it. But when did you realize when you began writing um, papers and editing chapters that you realized, oh, I actually have a knack for writing history and I'm really good at it. When did that spark happen? So I had inklings of it, and I, I think this is actually, it was a process. So I, there there are people who have knacks for it, but I really, I never had the discipline until after the military. I, this is actually one I get to really thank the military for. Uh, I, I struggled in the Navy, and anyone who knew me in that, my, that part of my career would understand that, that statement and probably even laugh at it. But the key part is I did certain things that built up discipline and over and over again. So once I got out and I was like, I always wanted to do history. I'm going to go to my get my undergrad in that and we'll see what happens after that. And then slowly over time, the articles that I was writing for for class, I realized uh, they're good. But if I do this, they might be better and they might be better and they might be better and they might be better. It was incremental each time. And I actually just broke one out. There was actually in my first article I published was binary submarine culture. And it talks about the it's in the center of international maritime security. And it's about the threat, the loss of the thresher. Very important milestone in the, the nuclear Navy. In my opinion, it's the milestone. Mm. I looked back and I was like, man, I've come a long way. <laughs> and it's it's a bad thing. It's just you you mature every piece with the article that you publish. And as you mature with those pieces, you'll realize that and you'll look back and like, I've learned a lot. Now, that wasn't all by myself, obviously. There was a right. certain amount of discipline that came with, with that process, but I had a lot of good mentors, both at Southern New Hampshire and at Portsmouth. Portsmouth more recently, and they've, they're pushing me in the right direction now. But I had a lot of good mentors who were like, you're doing well. You're not there yet, though. You're not, you're not at a published gold standard yet. And that's okay. You're not supposed to be there yet, but you'll get there. That's actually really true, and I 100% agree. When I look back at my old writings, I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I used to write that. I cringed. But as you said, it is a process. You grow with your writing, and you realize that how you wrote in the past is not the same as what you're writing now. My language has completely changed, and it's like, wow, it, it is really fascinating like, how far we've come. And kind of going back to your book, uh, book there's now a question i want to ask you about more of like the the business side of like being an author which is when you wrote your book and like fine-tuned and got everything ready for um publication and everything um did you kind of like have an idea of if you wanted to be traditionally published with a publishing house that specializes in historical nonfiction or academic reference books 
or did you want to have more um, control of your material and go the self-publishing route? I, I'm actually really glad that self-publishing has become much more acceptable and there's been a lot more methods to actually get that out there. But the for academic works, for anyone who's considering an academic work, it's pretty difficult to get get the the acceptability still. And that's the, the academic institutions are very conservative. So I set out and I said, I want to do a traditional publisher, got everything done. And then I, I said, all right, well, who do I send it to? Now, I remembered actually a recommendation given by Catherine Pierce when she was like, when you have your book, you should look at the books that you've cited. And that that's who that's who you'll know who's your general general production. And they're generally university presses, uh, which I did apply to. There are Pen and Sword Maritime was one of them, and I'm very happy they did it. There was a couple others that were smaller niche publishing. Um, a lot of them focus on genealogy and biographies and nothing wrong with that. But that I made great pains to say this is a micro history, not biography. I just don't have the sources to do a biography, honestly. Right. So I did I did set out traditionally and it was good advice because eventually someone got back to me. Awesome. Awesome. I'm actually glad you brought up Pen and Sword. And for those who don't know, Pen and Sword is arguably, in my opinion, probably one of like the best publishing houses for historical reference and nonfiction books. They have some of the best categories. I know a lot of good friends that have published with Pen and Sword. It's great. I cannot recommend them more than enough. So go and check them out. But that's really cool that your professor gave you that kind of like stepping stone. Just like you've referenced all of these books. Look at who has uh, published these books and go from there. That's really cool. I never really thought of that, but it is true. So now... Now we get into more personal questions, well, more personal questions, which is, so now at this point in your life, um, Ryan, um, looking back at all the accomplishments that you've made, have you ever sit, sat back and thought to yourself, wow, I've or your world will be like if you didn't make this book? There are times I forget that I, I I'll be talking with friends. And I forget that I even have a master's degree. Like, I, like oh yeah, and like, oh yeah, I do have that. I can't complain about that. Um, it's been fast for me. I, I got out in 2019, December 2019. I went from just a, a junior enlisted sailor at 25 getting out to now. I am a historian. I am. I have gotten. I've done a professional career that's still in the defense industry. I've done a lot of things. Um, I think if I fully realized it, I would probably stop writing because I have done as I approach 30, I have done nearly everything I wanted to do. Um, having said that, there's a lot. One of the cool things, and I really hope about going back to a promise, I hope one of the cool things that comes out of this book is a renewed search for artifacts that people are like, wow, that's really cool. Why don't we know more? Or, hey, I think that's wrong. I actually think that we but that. Yeah, that makes sense for the 20s. But. What if bro was different? And I think I have a source that proves that. I'd love to hear those. And I'd love to have those. So to me, writing again with a process, it's a continuing conversation. And maybe in 20, 20, 30 years, I'll be writing a book like, hey, everything I said was wrong. Here's the revised edition. Oh, that's be true. Fun. That is very I'd love, true. I'd, I'd, I would love to see a, a new historian come in and like, hey, I found his personal papers. I found all of his letters. Perfect. Let's have this conversation. I'd love to see it. Nice. Very nice. And then that kind of leads into probably like one of my favorite questions of the interview, which is in your life right now, have you ever gotten a sense of validation from other historians uh, in the academic field or even abroad, uh, especially on LinkedIn, where there's a huge house of historians and saying that we've seen your work, you belong in this community. Because I know, especially we're talking with a lot of historians and authors now for about almost two to three years, they do give me like the same, almost like the same response that, you know, being a historian, it is engaging, but it's lonely. It's something that's very difficult to find a job, depending on your field, and trying to be not so much as freelance, but be very more part-time and full-time. And it can be very defeating. So... I guess to wrap it all together, have you had that experience of like a sense of validation from fellow 
academics and historians in your field of naval history and maybe even outside your historical uh, research background? I would say that my I felt like a historian when I got that article published the first time. I didn't call myself anything that anything with that first in July of 2022 when that first one came out I was like I'm a historian now I'm part of the conversation and I've I've had people reach out and like no I disagree and here's why and it's you know someone that I cited in the article when when someone is talking to you like that it's hard to not feel validated it was like you know what even if I am wrong and that that's always a fear of mine like no mistake I'm terrified of having like <laughs> hey analysis is great but there's a piece of data that you didn't know about there's always that and you have to you have to balance that with we're doing the best we can right now with the information we have right now and the answer might be yeah you're wrong but there'll be new information that comes out of that that's better that makes the entire discipline better uh and i i think it was seeing so i received a distinction on my dissertation which is a summa cum laude effectively is the best way to put that and uh, I, I read the feedback, and the feedback was from my primary supervisor, which was Matthew at the time, Matthew Heaslip, and he said, this is a very good distinction. You should be proud of it. Said, yeah, I do feel proud of it. I felt good. And LinkedIn definitely helps with that. I, mm -hmm. I wish there was more conversations with historians on LinkedIn. Uh, the, the, I would love to see more people. If anyone watches this and is, is a friend with mine on LinkedIn, please engage me in the conversation. I had put a lot of pictures out there. I try to do... I used to try to do it once a day. Uh, then I started running out of photographs. So that's <laughs> pe what people generally love to respond to. So I feel like that's a great way of starting that. Um, it is difficult to find a job in that I'm lucky in that regard because I got out and I stayed in the industry that I was in, the defense industry. And as as a test engineer, I, I feel like I ha actually, I joke with people all the time. People are like, oh, what, what, what good's a naval history degree? as a test engineer and i was like i use it every day i i file reports the same very similarly i file reports i have to do research all the time i have to connect the dots i have to figure out what's going on from people who left the company you know i i do all these things all the time and naval history helps me every day and awesome. it's the same people who say oh you didn't do that are the people's reports that i'm generally correcting <laughs> well you are you it's like it's like you didn't do it. it's like well let me see uh yeah actually you did <laughs> but but i 100 percent agree and especially the feeling of publishing the first article i'm feeling yes i am a historian when i actually got out of school i got out in 2021 and i went to san francisco state when i got out i didn't know what to do i just got a job as a tutor and then one of my friends in the uk who um, uh, was working with the uh, historians magazine told me saying, Hey, you know, you should, you should probably try your hand in an article. And I'd never written an historical piece at all. And so when I did, I was like, okay, I'll get it. And then I get the link that it's been published. And it's like, uh, it was the origins of the gladiators by Gabriel Garcia. I was like, yes, I've done it. And I have immortalized it on my wall in my room. And then from yeah. there, I started working on a whole bunch of articles from the Harlem Hellfighters, um, for the Hellfighter magazine, the Night of Democracy, Simon de Montfort. So that feeling that you have something out there validating all the years and time you put into your degree, it really does show, as you said, that you are now in a story. You are validated. You are who you say you are, that like you belong in this field, which is an amazing feeling. And that kind of leads into the last question, because we're now um, nearing the end of the interview, um, which is so, Ryan, um, with all your years of experience um, in your field and all the research that you've done and the trials and tribulations that you've had to reach this point in your life, what is your word of wisdom to other historians wanting to get their hands um, in this field or people who want to try the historian program for the first time. So one thing I noticed, and it, this this didn't happen consciously, throughout my undergrad, I kept writing about naval history topics, not necessarily about submarines, but I kept talk, writing about naval history topics. And then I realized the reason why that's where privateers came from. And I was like, oh, it's because it's connected. It has been connected in the popular mind, especially to U-boat warfare in the first, second world wars. So I realized, oh, there's a connection there. I I want 
I was co- unconsciously driven towards that. Listen to that that instinct that's drawing you to that. And once you have a subject, once you have the research, once you have everything done, because this was a this book was going to be at the when it's published is about a four year research project. So it doesn't have to be tomorrow, but once you have it and you're like, all right, I think I have an idea of where I want to take it. Write a thousand words a day. That's about sixty thousand words in two months. If you can get that done and you have a draft that you can start poking holes in and, and editing, you can start proposing, put, putting out proposals for traditional publishers. So listen to your gut and what you actually, I personally really believe that your own historicity, despite whatever subjective lens that it may subject that subject to, you should follow that path because if you write what you know. It's actually an old literary trope. It's write what you know. Uh, so write your own history, write the history that you feel connected to, and you'll you'll it'll write itself almost. It's actually shocking. <laughs> That's 100 percent true. Write what you know, because as you say, it is true. We all are drawn to a subject that we love. Like my background is classical antiquities. I love writing about uh, the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians. And that's what I enjoy doing. Now, I enjoy the other aspects of history, military history, medieval history, um, East Asian history. I love all of that. But if I had to pick the one I feel the most comfortable writing in or the one that I really enjoy and that puts a smile on my face, it is classical antiquity, just as I imagine um, naval history is uh, to you. And at the end of the day, as you said, just write what you know, which is probably the most truest statement for any historian. And with that, we will end this wonderful interview here on the channel. Now, before we officially end, I want to thank our guest, uh, Ryan Walker, for joining us today. Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show. You've been an amazing guest. And where can people find and engage with you to know more about your work and any upcoming projects that they should be looking out for? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm primarily on LinkedIn. That's that's my preferred medium. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn, Ryan C. Walker. Facebook, I do have Facebook. I generally use that on the Silent Services First Hero Facebook page. I am on TikTok, C. Walker 761. Uh, S-E-A Walker, uh, clever little Ryan C. Walker <laughs> pun. And of course, email, you can reach me at, uh, go to LinkedIn, it's, it's located on there. I'm not gonna spell that one out for everybody. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I will link all those down below um, in this video so you can go check out uh, Ryan. And also, uh, one last thing, Ryan, uh, when should people hopefully expect um, the silent hero? When should we possibly see that on shelves? July 2024. So this year. Awesome. Awesome. So listeners, you heard it first. Be on the lookout for that book. And if you do, take a picture of it and send it to Ryan because as authors, we love feedback. We love reviews because that helps build our own um, notoriety. I know that from experience that reviews help the most. So please give some love to my friend Ryan with this book and his other projects. And thank you all for being here and watching this amazing interview. Again, I want to thank our guest Ryan for joining us and providing his knowledgeable insight on naval history and of course his book and i wish him the great success going forward thank you so much you're absolutely welcome and with that listeners i will see you all in future episodes later this month be on the lookout if you are subscribed to my newsletter then you have a good idea who the next set of guests are until next time this has been the wandering scribe and the wandering quill signing out